a report by the committee, however, maintains that there was evidence of misconduct against Professor Ransford Jampo and Dr. Paul Kwame Butako. The report reads in part that subsequently, the committee's terms of references, as indicated, were to ascertain whether the actions of the lecturers constitute an act of sexual harassment and or misconduct with reference of university policy. Also find out whether the actions of the constitutes of a breach of conditions of service for senior members and regulations of the university and public service. Also ascertain whether their actions have brought the name of the University of Ghana into disrepute and also investigate any other related matters that the committee may consider noteworthy. Summary of findings and recommendations as we also have it is indicating that the committee finds that the title of the documentary Sex for Great is misleading and sensational. Two, the committee also finds that it's more probable than not that there were other encounters between the lecturers and the BBC journalists that have not been captured in the documentary. The committee also finds that apart from the bare assertions of the BBC and Professor Ransford Jampo, it finds no evidence to conclude that Abigail introduced herself to Professor Jampo as a student of the University of Ghana or the Ghana Institute of Journalism. Four, the committee is unable also to conclude that Dr. Paul Kwame Butako offered a national service work placement in his department to Zara despite telling her the deadline for applications had passed. Five, the committee does not find any prima facie evidence to suggest any finding that the conduct of the two lecturers satisfy the ingredient of misconduct in paragraphs 10.1, 12.1, and 12.4 of the Code of Conduct of Senior Members of the University of Ghana or the definitions of sexual harassment and misconduct under the anti-sexual harassment and misconduct policy of the University of Ghana. It also continues that the committee knows that in the absence of any evidence that Zara and Abigail, who are the two models the BBC undercover journalists put out as students or members of the University of Ghana, the provisions of paragraphs 10.1, 12.1, and 12.4 of the conduct of the senior members of the University of Ghana and the anti-sexual harassment and misconduct policy of the university cannot be triggered against the affected lecturers. In conclusion and subsequent recommendations, the committee finds credible evidence of misconduct against Professor Ransford Jampo and Dr. Paul Kwame Butako, contrary to paragraph 6.4 of the Code of Conduct of Senior Members of the University of Ghana. The committee also finds credible evidence of misconduct against Professor Ransford Jampo, contrary to statute 421EI of the University Statute, which states no member of the university shall engage in a course of vexatious conduct that is directed at one or more specific individuals, and two, that is known to be unwelcome. Well, uh, we had a man on the beat, Maxwell Agbagba, is joining me right here in the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, what can you tell us about the full report that's emerging? Well, you remember sometime in October, on October 7th, after the airing of the um, BBC documentary Sex for Grades, um, the University of Ghana actually constituted a fact-finding committee to um, investigate the matter and ascertain um, some of the claims that have been made you know, in that documentary. So that committee was put together and was chaired by Justice Retired Vida Kutubanfo. It was a five-member uh, um, committee. Um, so after the um, investigations by the fact-finding committee, on November 20, um, the Director of Public Affairs of the University of Ghana, Stella Amwa, actually released a statement on the University of Ghana website um, mm. stating that a prima facie um, case has been established um, against um, the two lecturers who were implicated um, in that documentary. Um, but that statement really did not provide the details of the, um, the, the work 
that had gone into um, that report. All we had was a secular from the University of Ghana. So what is emerging now um, is the, uh, the work that went into um, that particular uh, um, fact finding, the work that the fact finding committee actually did, and then the details. That's what we're getting now. So in November, um, they actually um, pushed the case to the investees' disciplinary committee because the prima facie um, case or evidence had been, had been established against the two lecturers who were implicated. So mm -hmm. as, we, as it stands now, the case is before the disciplinary committee. Um, committee of the University of Ghana. We understand that Professor Ranzo Jampo has already um, appeared um, before the committee. Um, Dr. Paul Nuta, uh, Nuta Butako has also um, appeared before um, that committee. But it's interesting, some of the um, findings, um, you know, in, in, in that report. Interesting now, because when that circular came out on November 20, we didn't have the privilege to, to get, you know, the details of that circular issued um, by the university. One of the things that um, they mentioned was about the procedure, the meetings and then the procedure of that particular committee. We are told that the committee actually met um, five times and then um, they made, um, there were written statements from the BBC. The people who were implicated in the documentary were also invited and then other people, other interest, other parties were also invited. Um, the committee states that it actually invited um, the BBC to provide contacts and addresses of the two undercover journalists who were used um, in the documentary by the BBC absolutely declined and said To submit any of those? To submit any Even of the those. raw footages? Um, even the raw footages. Mm. But what they did was to submit a written, you know, uh, um, account Or of response. Response of what they, I mean, they found. So they did that, they provided that, but failed to um, provide to the committee the address, the contact, and how the, uh, the committee could reach um, the persons, um, the two ladies, uh, who were the undercover, you know, journalists on basis that they have to protect, you know, those people. Again, um, the committee said it finds the sets for great documentary, the title, sex for grades, sensational and misleading. misleading. And it says it's because they, they realized that there was a wide variance between the title and then um, the contents of the, uh, uh, um, of the documentary itself, such that the title suggesting sex for grades on reality we, they had no evidence of sex, you know, for grades in that particular um, documentary, Roland. Mm, but before we go on to the, yeah. the, the related issues about whether the committee assessed that both lecturers argued mm. and also maintained that the audiovisual recording does not give an accurate account of uh, what the encounters were, uh, who were members of the committee, so to speak? Well, um, the chairperson of the committee... Somebody will be curious um, to act. Yeah, Justice Retired, um, Vida Kutubanfu, she was a chairperson. And then um, Professor Charlotte Wrigley Asante, she's the director of Sigenza. Mm -hmm. um, she was a member of the committee. Professor Michael Piki, or chairful, he is the dean of the School of Arts. He was also a member. Dr. Abdul Basit Aziz Bamba, he's, a, uh, he's at the School of Law. And then uh, Miss Dory. Doris Ansa is a former student of the University of Ghana, and then Mr. W. N. Tovino, who acted as a secretary to the committee, Roland. Th this report, does it give any indication as to why the two lecturers uh, mm -hmm. would indicate that, well, the related issues of um, the audiovisual recording did mm -hmm. not uh, truly represent the accurate details mm -hmm. of the accounts that took place? Well, in their defense, according to the reports that we have, um, from according to the report of the fact-finding committee, uh, the two lecturers argued that what we saw in that documentary and then the evidence provided by the BBC did not capture the entire encounter that they had um, with the two undercover journalists. And you remember that when the story uh, came out first, um, Professor Ransford Jumpo actually argued that it was just aspect of their conversations that were put out there as the documentary. But really, they had conversations with the lady herself being responsive to some of the messages that, you know, he was exchanging with her and that she did not do that. They, the, the undercover journalists did not do that under, you know, um, duress. So that was the argument um, the, two, um, uh, the two lecturers actually put up that 
the documentary did not capture the entire conversation and encounters that they had with the um, undercover journalists. Mm. Meaning that uh, they had had some lengthy discussions, some exactly. acquaintances in the exactly. processes exactly. in the meantime. Mm. Uh, but but there are also there, there are peculiar issues about the code of conduct for mm. senior members of the university. Yeah. And, and that is at the heart of all these discussions that we're exactly. having currently. Exactly. Uh, and that also relates to the mm. anti-sexual harassment and misconduct policy of the university. The university yeah. uh, but we're also being told this cannot be triggered. Mm. Yes, and um, let me take you to um, point 19 of the report. In, it states that the committee finds that under paragraphs 10.1 and 12.4 of the Code of Conduct of Senior Members of the University of Ghana and the anti-sexual harassment and misconduct policy of the university, the victim of the misconduct must be a member of the university. Consequently, the committee notes that in the absence of any evidence that Zara and Abigail, the two BBC undercover journalists, are students or members of the University of Ghana, the provisions of 10.1, 12.1, and 12.4 of the Code of Conduct of Senior Members of the University of Ghana and the anti-sexual harassment and misconduct policy of the university cannot be triggered against the affected lecturers. And that is because um, the evidence before the committee does not suggest that they are students of the University of Ghana. And indeed, they are not students of the University of Ghana. So um, the, the anti-sexual harassment, so exactly. So anti harassment policy of the university cannot be triggered. But the university, in its conclusion, stated that because they are not students of the University of Ghana, but they are rules governing, rules and regulations governing how senior members of the university actually interact with even outsiders. So that is what is triggering um, that case of um, vexatious you know, um, conduct. So let me just read 20, the conclusion 20 for you. It says, after carefully examining the available evidence, the committee finds credible evidence of misconduct against Professor Ramso Jampo and Dr. Paul Kwame Butako, contrary to paragraph 6.4 of the Code of Conduct of senior members of the University of Ghana, which stipulates that, quote, academic staff shall at all times comport themselves in ways that will enhance their image and that of the university, unquote. In addition, they say, we find credible evidence of misconduct against Professor Ramso Jampo, mm. contrary to statutes of the university statute, which states that no member of the university shall e engage in a course of vexatious conduct that is directed at one or more specific individuals. So although the university cannot trigger any case of sexual harassment against these lecturers, it has triggered um, this case of vexatious conduct. Okay. We have to let you go, though. But before mm. we do that, uh, we also do know, while this is not speculated, because yeah. these statements were emphatically made about mm. some other related students, this time of the investor, who had yeah. also raised certain related issues mm. with the committee. Mm. Did this also come up? Even yes. though perhaps maybe not contained in the report? No, it act it's actually contained oh, in the okay. report. It's in the um, final part of the report, and it says that that's 22, and it says that with regard to the other specific allegations of misconduct against Professor Ransford Jampo by some former students of the University of Ghana, the committee recommends that these complaints be inquired into within the context of the requisite adjudicatory process stipulated under the basic law and policies of the university, namely the disciplinary committee for senior members of the adjudicatory committee of the anti-sexual harassment um, committee so something has also been done about other cases that perhaps will come out of this um, issue subsequently yeah well thank you very much we also don't know you're following uh, on the subject exactly. and comprehensively uh, subsequently other bulletins and programming on the channel you will very much be briefed but in the meantime we'll move on and the chairman of the national development planning commission professor Stephen Adair says the development of Ghana uh, so far as experienced in the past 25 years is just by chance. He insists the only period where Ghana truly developed deliberately in that era was the 2001 to 2008 period when as a country we implemented a World Bank led Ghana poverty reduction strategy. Now speaking on the Super Morning Show, the former member of the Vision 2020 team said as early as January 2000, the plan had been abandoned by the Rawlings administration. In when Nkrumah became the leader of government business, mm -hmm. they, he followed a 10-year plan, interestingly. And that was on diet. Most of the positive things were done, even though when we became independent, it was adjusted, you know, there was a one-year transition. But basically, that framework continued until 1960. And every Ghanaian 
can point to a lot of achievement during that period. Mm -hmm. Of course, he lost his way when he became a republic. I mean, a lot of when I hear people talking about the seven-year development plan, as it was just more or less one of was a good documents. Interestingly, it was prepared under the leadership of J.H. Mensah. Mm. <laughs> yes, J.H. Mensah was the secretary of planning. Small so world. The seven-year development plan was actually the product of J.H. Mensah. <laughs> Who then became, who later became minority leader <laughs> and he, senior minister, minister of the of the of the, the, of the for government. Yes. Also, of course, he became. Of course, the, he was leader of opposition. Yes, um, at, at a point. It's quite interesting that, but he was actually a public servant mm. on Dan Cromer, and he mm. was the key architect of the seven-year development plan. But what I want to say is not that. What the most important thing that this. When the seven-year development plan came into being in 1963-64, the economy was in shambles, and Chroma had no money, debt was accumulating, and people don't know that for almost three years, the seven-year development plan was supposedly implemented by Chroma, and nothing was done. So people say, you know, if the seven-year development plan after Chroma had been followed, the reality is that the economic situation, the macroeconomic situation, the mismanagement of the economy was such that even under him, nothing was done. In fact, I was reading somewhere and I said, oh my goodness. He said that, you know, under it we have the Akosomo. No, Akosomo took about 20 years to do. In fact, Akosomo came online in 1963. So it couldn't have been done on there. Most of the things that, and there's a lot to credit in Chroma for, for mm -hmm. Ghana, but none of them really was done under the seven-year development plan. It was before, and most of it, when we had a 10-year plan. The point I'm trying to make is this. Whenever a nation consistently commits to a program for about 10 years or plus, like God is back, like the 1950s, uh, 1950s to early 60s, mm -hmm. and on the Kufo's administration, when, uh, not before that, under Rawlings, from 1983 to 1992, mm -hmm. when we had the economic recovery program, mm -hmm. so following you mean 83 to 92, 83 to 92, mm -hmm. yes, when we had this consistent program, and then we come to Kufu under the Ghana Poverty Reduction Program, one and two, yes, one and two, you see that the country makes good strides. And therefore, we, is something that we should, our own history shows that once we have a plan and we commit to and we implement it, the country moves forward significantly. And when we don't, as we, are, we have been experiencing for many parts of uh, a significant part of our nation, the country goes haywire. And between especially 1973 and 1983, we development economists call the lost decade. You won't believe that over that decade, because of the changes and inconsistencies, mm -hmm. the average Ghanaian GDP per capita declined by 40 percent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I sometimes, and there's no doubt that's what gave rose, uh, uh, gave rise to this. Uh, coups and interventions, because when there's economic uh, future is not good, then it gives room for adventurists. But some still argue that there was massive infrastructure investment by some of those presidents, some of those um, military era presidents. Which, which were the massive ones? The Snit Flats came in in that era. The Snit Flats in most of the uh, regional <laughs> capitals came in Is that, in that a era. massive infrastructure? Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> when we are talking mm. about massive infrastructure for our development, you, we are talking not about some Senate flats, how much do people are. We are talking about changing the basic infrastructure of the country. But have we seen a housing investment post the Senate flat era as large as that? The question is this we are not going to house Ghanaians, that's my personal view, okay. by public housing projects. It's just meant for political gimmicks. The economy should be such that the average Ghanaian should be able to build their own building and living. 
Uh, that's the chairman of the National Development Planning Commission, Professor Stephen Adair, during his interaction with Super Morning Show host Daniel Datsi. Well, you're still watching Join News Prime and still ahead in the bulletin. The Electoral Commission to go ahead with a compilation of a new voters register as the inter party resistance movement against the new voters register now series of demonstrations against the Electoral Commission's decision. Their position, definitely that one cannot actually um, contradict or counteract the constitutional mandate given by the EC so far as compilation of a new voters register is concerned. But, but Something we're all happy about. The multimedia group gets loud applause for some of Ghana's greats as the media giant celebrates 25 years of broadcasting excellence this year. Well, make sure you are interactive. Facebook Join News on TV is always available. We have a Twitter handle, uh, Join News on TV. You can also watch us live through My Door Online TV on YouTube. In the meantime, we're taking a break. When we come back, we have more right here. Also watching Join News Prime, we have to do showbiz, but before then, the multimedia group gets loud applause as the media giant celebrates 25 years of broadcasting excellence this year. Uh, some statesmen have been sharing the impact of Joy FM, particularly over the years, and what they look forward to in the new year. First is former president John Ejakum Kofor, who wants Joy FM, and the other subsidiaries of the group to continue being responsible beyond the Silver Jubilee? Well, uh, Joy is a, a, a leading media house. And I believe you've attained your position by showing responsibility in social sense. And my prayer is that you continue even into your... Uh, is it Silver Jubilee? That's correct. Uh, as you say, we we'll celebrate your 25th next year. So uh, you continue to show responsibility in, uh, in, in your work for the development of our country. Next year, as you know, is uh, election year. The nation goes to polls to elect a, the president and also parliament. Um, it's a very important year. Uh, yes, politics moves on propaganda and uh, that sort of thing. But I would expect that Joy would use its uh, good offices to promote sensible, positive, and uh, successful electioneering. Joy must not lend its services to causes that would lead to disruption and uh, stabilization of our country. Uh, so this is what I would expect Joy to do for Ghana next year. Well, I think that Joy FM for 25 years, first of all, uh, congratulations in advance. I think that you've been a very uh, a major, major addition uh, to the freedom of um, information and, and communication and uh, you've, you've really contributed a lot to political discourse in this country, allowing people to get, have access to information, putting all of us on our toes. Um, I think that Ghana is so much the better for this Joy brand. It's a, a brand that I think um, all Ghanaians will appreciate. Um, and, and we thank God for, for the EU being here. I'll we'll have to bring you more. Uh, next, the Interparty Resistance Against the New Voters Register. They have announced a series of demonstrations to take place in parts of the country to drum home their demand for the Electoral Commission to back down on its decision to compile a new voters register. The protests are expected to begin from Tamale on January 11 and will ultimately culminate in a mammoth procession on January 28. 
the group made up of the APC, the PNC, and the NDC, and other parties at the press conference right here in the capital also called on civil society groups, faith-based organizations, to rise up against the Electoral Commission's decision to compile a new voters' register to cost the taxpayer more than 400 million Ghana cities. And they believe this funds could have been used to extend other projects to other sectors of the economy. For us, we are saying if the EC wants a new voter register, we are not against a new voter register at all. The timing is wrong. The period is not prudent. The, the situation is bad. Look, to, to, to conduct a new register, you need not less than two years to get all the documents and everything intact. The group says it will, in the coming days, outline a series of activities, including protest marches, to drum home their concerns. On Saturday, the 1st, 11th of January, 2020, we shall be in Tamale for the mega Tokusai. The Dogomba word Tokusai means we will not agree. Demonstration. The conveying point will be the Tamale Jubilee Park at 6 a.m. We shall follow up with Yempini, the Santi West demonstration in Kumasi on Tuesday, 21st January, 2020, and climax with, oh, this word, Wukupini, 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 demonstration in Accra on Tuesday, 28th of January, 2020. The parties have also been powering some of the explanations the Electoral Commission has been giving for the procurement of a new register. According to General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, the Electoral Commission is essentially procuring a solution for a problem which does not exist. If you buy a brand new vehicle and you go and park it at a fitting shop that they should repair that vehicle, <laughs> what impression are you creating for yourselves? <laughs> you see? So that is what they are doing. They themselves are saying that thing is credible. If it is credible, why? If it is not broken, why would you fix it? So that is why we are against it. We are not against it because we are in government or we are in opposition. We are against proposals that don't make sense. Your resources and our resources. Let us protect it. All the parties in unison say they are going to stand and present a single front to ensure that the Electoral Commission does not go ahead to procure the new register. They are calling on civil society groups, faith-based organizations, the Peace Council specifically, to step in and rise against what they describe as their decision not in the interest of Ghanaians. From the press centre here in Accra, I am Komla Dom reporting for Joy News. And in a rather sharp response to the inter-party resistance against a new voters' register, the deputy chairperson for the Electoral Commission in charge of elections, Samuel Tete, said no political party can hold the Electoral Commission to ransom in executing its constitutional mandate. EC is an independent uh, organization, and um, it was actually set up by the constitution. It has a, a clear mandate, a clear functions, and other things. And we all work in the interest of what the nation, what the EC thinks is the best, is what they can do. So it is not up to one or two political parties to decide for yeah, the people more than of one or two. Well, I, I, because I'm not actually privy to the the press conference that you are just talking about that we have PNC, APC, and all that. In fact, I don't actually um, know about the press conference, so I don't know the political parties who are saying that there's no need. Yes, but what I'm saying is, even if they have their um, view, their position, their, um, what do you call it, their, okay, their position, definitely that one cannot actually um, contradict or counteract the constitutional mandate given by the EC so far as compilation of a new voters register. But, but you agree that the NDC is totally in condemnation of a new voters register? Well, they have actually made their intentions at the IPAC meetings mm -hmm. that they are not in favor of the new voters register. But don't forget that the 1992 constitution, Article 45A, actually gives the commission the mandate to compile a voters register and then revise it at such periods 
that it may consider necessary. But it's the so, same constitution the NDC is quoting for you that you can only um, compile a new voters register mm -hmm. after a population census has been conducted. Have we conducted any population census? Why let, are you let, let me let, let me register? Let me draw your mind back to the press conference that we actually held. The compilation of new voters register does not necessarily come after census. Mm. No, all of us agree that the voters register that we have now is bloated. How? It's bloated in the sense that if you look at the way we clean the voters register, it is not able to give us the correct number of people on the voters register. Mm. And we all have to really blame ourselves for not taking interest to clean what? The register. Political parties are to be blamed in the sense that when even it is time for registration, you find them taking active part in busing people to go and then register. But when it comes to cleaning during exhibition, you can bear with me that the turnout is virtually very low. The full interview is on PM Express tonight at 9 p.m. Please do make a date. Moving on, Tuesday, that is tomorrow, uh, 7th of January 2020, and Ghanaians will commemorate the birth of the Fourth Republic, the collective commitment to a regime of an uninterrupted constitutional order, the 1992 Constitution of Ghana, which ushered in the Fourth Republican dispensation, turns 27 years tomorrow. Daniel Datsi has been engaging some students of Yokra Technical University on the purpose of Tuesday's holiday, the Constitution Day. It was on the 7th of January 1993 that we decided to put the Constitution in power with the swearing in of the new president. Today, we celebrate Constitution Day in exactly 24 hours. So we've come to the campus of Accra Technical University to ask the students what they think about Constitution Day and what they know about the Constitution. Um, my friends here are studying, so we'll try and keep this as short as possible. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. So what do you know about the Constitution? Uh, actually, what I know about the Constitution is, Constitution is a set of rules or uh, I don't know what to say. Set of rules used to govern a country or something. Great. Great. How about you? What do you? What have you heard about it? Oh, well, like just as he said, is a rules and regulations for governing a country. Do you think it's important? Oh yes. Without it, we can't have freedom and peace in the country. So, do you know any rights that the constitution gives you? Yes, yeah, I have the right to vote, and I think it's passed. Have you voted before? Yes, I've voted before. Really? Hey, you look like I'm the age. Anyway, yeah. let me ask you, what do you know about the Constitution? I know it's a set of rules for governing a country. It allows us to get our rights and our freedom to do whatever we like in a country as we are in the democratic world. That sounds good. So tell me, if we did not have the Constitution, what do you think will be in Ghana now? Chaos. Chaos and chaos. Because... You know, with the constitution, it set the rules where where, where uh, somebody where's your right begins is where somebody's rights end. Mm -hmm. So with the constitution, it, it gives the, the fundamental lay down of uh, everybody's right. You know where your right begin, where your right end. So where your right end is where somebody's right begins. So I think it is a laudable idea, and I'll I'll, I'll support the constitution every day. So which rights do you enjoy now that the constitution has given you? Freedom of freedom of movement, mm -hmm. freedom of speech freedom of joining our association. And I'm enjoying almost everything that comes with it. That's great, that's great. But let me ask, tomorrow is Constitution Day, and because of that, no one will work, at least if you're not in an essential service. How important do you guys think it is for us to have a holiday set aside to remember the Constitution? Let me start with my man here. Oh, okay, it is very cool because um, we are going to use tomorrow as a day to remember everything. You see, to even educate the children, you see, through television shows and what have you, so that the children will get to know what our constitution entails, so that they can be able to fight for their right or in the nearby future or something like that. So it's very crucial for um, the government to take a time like that to celebrate our constitution. So I think 
is very important. Some would say that we should rather use the time to work hard so that the country prospers more. What do you think? Well, I know of this statement that all work and no play make Jack a dull boy. So I don't think it's bad thing about it. So I think if that day is set for us, I think it's a good like doing revision for exam. As I think it's good. It's good for the government to do that. It looks like someone doesn't want to go for lectures tomorrow. What do you think? Do you think the Constitution Day holiday is important? Yeah, it's very important. Because as a human being, you can't be working at any time, which makes you dull. You, you have to get some time to entertain, to refresh yourself. And with that, it even improves your mental faculty. You see, that is it. So you agree that the holiday improves your mental faculty? No, I don't agree. I don't even see the essence of the holiday, to be sincere, because they are saying that it's constitutional day, so holiday. I, I still don't get why is it constitutional day should be a holiday. So what would you rather we would do to mark the starting of our constitution? Starting of our constitution? Yeah, or the, the establishment of the constitution. If we wanted to mark it in a way, how would you rather we marked it? I remember that there's a constitution. Yeah. I mean, as long as we are living, everyone knows that there's a constitution, so there's no need to mark it. Mm. It doesn't really matter? It doesn't really matter. Interesting, interesting. So he feels it doesn't really matter. What do you think? I don't think it matters at all. You can, we can remember our constitution every day. We shouldn't set aside a day to remember our constitution. I don't think it is necessary. I don't think it is important. It is a waste of time. That day could have, could have, been, could have been used for another purpose. We can remember our constitution every day. We shouldn't set aside to remember our constitution, which means that things should begin from the day one, from the kindergarten. Let's instill it in our educational system. Let's kids know this is what the constitution stands for. This is what it meant for this country. But setting aside a day, and they'll just go speech without nothing. I don't think it is important to me. I don't think it is relevant at all. So there's no debate about the importance of the Constitution, and it looks like the education about our rights and freedoms is fairly balanced. But whether or not the day should be set aside as a holiday, hmm, the jury is still out on this one. For Joy News, Daniel Dazi, Native U Campus. And that's it for the bulletin. We hope that you enjoy the package. Make sure that you keep staying tuned right here on the channel. And please make sure also you get interactive. Facebook Join News on TV is always available. We also do have a Twitter handle, uh, Join News on TV. And always make sure you watch us live through my John Online TV. That's it. Good evening.